Hello! We're going to be thinking in this video about carbohydrates. We're going to be thinking about it at AS level. So first of all, we need to think about what monomers, dimers and polymers are. You should know about this from your GCSE chemistry, uh, but unless you need a very brief and very undetailed refresher, here we go. So if we take this circle as being an individual unit of one, that would count as a monomer. Now if we start joining a few of these together, like this, uh, this would be a dimer. There are two units joined together, that is a dimer as opposed to a monomer. And if you have many of these all joined together, then you would count them as being a polymer. So a monomer is one unit by itself, a dimer is two units joined together, and a polymer is many repeating units. How might that look in practice? Well, let's consider this Cloud City car here. This is clearly a dimer. You can see there are two repeating units here, just this one here and this one here. And if we look at its schematics, Yes, you can clearly see that it's made out of two cars joined together. Each one of these would be a monomer. So that is a monomer, that is a monomer, uh, and by themselves, you would classify, if you broke this up, uh, each one would individually be a monomer, and we could indeed put more onto here if we wanted to. And so here's our next unit, very poorly drawn by myself. Uh, that is going to be a trimer, if you want, and you keep on doing this, putting extra units on, and it becomes a polymer. So at AS level, we need to think about monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. And really, these uh, terms just mean the same thing as before. Monosaccharides, general characteristics, they are hydrophilic, they are small, they are soluble and sweet tasting. Disaccharides, likewise, are hydrophilic small, soluble, and sweet tasting. They're small, but obviously they're twice the size of monosaccharides. Polysaccharides are still hydrophilic, but they are too large to be fully soluble. Therefore, they are osmotically neutral. In contrast to monosaccharides and disaccharides, which are osmotically active, polysaccharides are, are osmotically neutral. Because they don't dissolve properly as well, they tend to be tasteless. All of these can be converted to glucose, and that glucose can then be used as a fuel for respiration. That is the main use of carbohydrates. They also do have some function in structure, and you'll think about that when we go through polysaccharides. What are monosaccharides? Well, they are individual units of sugars. And we define monosaccharides according to the number of the carbon atoms that they have. So a triose has three carbons in it, a pentose has five carbons, and a hexose six carbons. Examples of each would be triose phosphate. Now you haven't met triose phosphate yet. You will do when you go through uh, respiration and photosynthesis. It's very important in them. Pentose sugars, you will meet, go on to meet, ribose and deoxyribose, and these are the sugars in RNA and DNA, respectively. Hexose sugars, six carbon sugars, well, classically, of course, we know about glucose, C6H12O6, but there are others as well. There is fructose, and there is galactose. And these share the formula C6H12O6 also. Here is our glucose. Now you don't need to know at OCR about the glucose straight chain form, but here it is anyway. The significance of this straight chain form is that it can curl up and this oxygen here can react with this uh, oxygen on this uh, fifth carbon here. and we get it forming up into a ring shape. This ring shape can happen in two ways. This is the alpha glucose ring form. The only significance of this that you need to know about 
is that you have on the fourth carbon here an OH going down and on the first carbon here an OH going down. Notice the way that the carbons are numbered. They're numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 like this going round in this direction. So in alpha glucose OH points down uh, on the first carbon and OH points down on the fourth carbon. There is another way however that this glucose chain can bend up and that leads us to the other form of glucose and that is beta glucose. Oh, we've just blocked it out here. Beta glucose. And in the case of beta glucose Let me just draw it out here. Now this is the quick way to draw glucose. You can assume at each of these joints there is a carbon atom and you can assume that there are hydrogens and OHs all over the place. In beta glucose the OH here goes down just as in alpha but the OH on the first carbon goes up rather than down. So Carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are like that. And the OH goes up rather than going down there. That is beta glucose. And glucose can freely change between these three forms as long as it remains as a monosaccharide. Once it binds up with something else, uh, then it won't be able to pop into the straight chain form, but it's easily enough converted between alpha glucose and beta glucose. As already mentioned, fructose is a hexose. We also have galactose. All of them have the formula C6H12O6, and fructose looks like this. Now, it, when you look at it, first of all, you think, well, that's only a 5-carbon sugar because it's only got a ring of five sides to it. But we have a carbon over here, and we have a carbon over here, as well. So it is a six carbon sugar even though the ring only has five sides. This glucose over here, this is also alpha glucose but what we've done in this case is we've represented it in its three-dimensional form more accurately. It's not flat like a benzene ring. It is more of a jagged shape than that. Uh, here we could label off the carbons again. One, two, three, four, five and six. Those are our six carbons on alpha glucose with the OH pointing down and the OH pointing down there. And that's why we know that this is alpha glucose. So there's another feature we need to think about as well regarding monosaccharides and disaccharides. If you have a carbon atom on a sugar which is bound to an oxygen and to an OH group, well that carbon atom can reduce Cu2 plus and it can reduce it to Cu plus. So if you provide these carbon atoms on a sugar, for example if we look at this carbon atom here, this carbon atom is bound to this oxygen, it's bound to this OH group there, this can reduce the Cu2 plus in copper sulfate, Cu2 plus SO4 2 minus, to Cu plus. Now Benedict's solution, which you will be familiar with already as a test for glucose, contains CuSO4 and therefore lots of Cu2 plus atoms. This carbon atom can reduce the Cu2 plus atoms to Cu plus atoms and that causes this colour change from blue to red because the Cu plus ions precipitate out of solution. And this is the red precipitate you see in the positive Benedict's test. So we found this reducing carbon here. Can you find it in the fructose? Well, I suppose it's not really that difficult, is it? It's the one in the centre of all this coloured mass. Uh, this carbon here attached to an oxygen and an OH there. So this here is our reducing carbon in fructose. Let's think about disaccharides now. They're formed by two monosaccharides being joined together in a condensation reaction. For example, uh, if you take two alpha glucoses, if you join them together, you produce maltose. If you take one glucose and one fructose, join them together, you produce sucrose. And one glucose plus one galactose, you produce lactose. How does this work? 
this is a condensation reaction drawn out for us. And in this case, we're making maltose. But the principle is the same for others. These are two alpha glucoses here. We've got the OH pointed down there, 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 and there. So they're all pointed down. They're all alpha glucoses. And in a condensation reaction, we get this OH, H, and H there uh, from carbon. Well, let's number the carbons off. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And we'll do the same over here. Four, five, six. So the OH group on the carbon four on this glucose molecule and the OH group on the carbon one of this glucose molecule react together. Two H's and an O come off, they form the water, and then we form what is called a glycosidic bond between these two glucose molecules. Water has been removed, and we just have this oxygen atom here acting as a bridge between the two monosaccharides. This forms our disaccharide, in this case maltose. We would indeed fully label this bond as an alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bond. The principle is just the same for making sucrose and just the same for making lactose. It's just the monosaccharides that change. One thing to think about is the formulae that you end up with. With glucose, we have that very familiar formula, C6H12O6. Now there are two of them. Fine. So that makes a total of C12H24O12. But of course we've lost an H2O, and so our disaccharide, if we're bringing two hexoses together, is always going to have the formula C12, we don't lose any of them, but then h 22 O eleven. In fact, you can continue this. For each glycosidic bond that is formed, you remove an H2O from the formula. So if you're making a triose, for example, of a hexose, you would triple your C6H12O6, but then you would remove two H2Os from the formula because you're forming two glycosidic bonds. Next question is which of these carbons is a reducing carbon? Well, that shouldn't be too difficult for us here because we've got alpha glucose and alpha glucose. And we've already looked to see that this carbon here is attached to an OH and an O there. And this carbon here, likewise, attached to an OH and an O there. But what about in the maltose? Let me get rid of some of this uh, writing because it's all getting a little confusing. OK, well, this carbon here is no longer going to be a reducing carbon. It's not attached to an O and to an OH. So that is a no-go. But this one over here, that is still a reducing carbon. So maltose will act as a reducing sugar and will give you a positive test with a Benedict solution. Just before we go on from this slide, I want to think momentarily about the opposite to condensation reactions. A condensation reaction is so called because it gives out water, hence water condenses out. But the opposite to this is a hydrolysis reaction. And in hydrolysis, water is added in and the molecule is split open, just in exactly the opposite way to condensation. So maltose, here is our glycosidic bond of maltose down here. We add water into this bond and we hydrolyze it back into two alpha glucose molecules. You'll find that condensation and hydrolysis are commonplace in biochemistry. For example, if you are joining two amino acids together, you do so with a condensation reaction. If you are joining a fatty acid to glycerol, you do so with a condensation reaction. And in both of those cases, if you split polypeptide chains apart into their constituent amino acids, or you split a fatty acid off from a glycerol molecule, then you'll do that using a hydrolysis reaction. Condensation reactions require energy input from ATP. Hydrolysis reactions, being 
the converse of condensation, do not require energy input. Hence the hydrolysis reactions which go on in your gut do not require lots of ATP inside the lumen of your gut in order for the reactions to happen. However, when you are building larger molecules from the monomers, you do require a lot of energy so to do. OK, back to thinking about the reducing carbons on disaccharides. How about sucrose here? What do we think? Well, there's alpha glucose, but just as before when forming maltose, this reducing carbon has been used. Likewise, this reducing carbon, which was there on the fructose, has also been used in forming our glycosidic linkage. Therefore, sucrose does not have any reducing carbons on it. Therefore, sucrose will not act as a reducing sugar, and it will not give you a positive test with Benedict's. That is unless you can convert sucrose back into its monosaccharides, because all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. Therefore, if you can boil up sucrose with hydrochloric acid solution, then neutralize it again, you will end up with its constituent monosaccharides, the glucose and the fructose. The glucose and fructose, of course, are both reducing sugars, and they will then give you a positive Benedict's test. That is how you do a test for a non-reducing sugar. All disaccharides other than sucrose are reducing sugars, and polysaccharides, generally speaking, do not have enough reducing carbons on them to act as reducing sugars. Well, that's monosaccharides and disaccharides, along with condensation reactions and glycosidic linkages. You should also be able to remember and recall which of these monosaccharides and disaccharides can act as reducing sugars and to describe how to do a test for a non-reducing sugar. Polysaccharides are going to be the subject of the next video. I hope that's helpful.